What's at the core of achieving the good life? The major key to the good life? The major key is not in learning how to set goals. It is not in learning how to better manage your time. It is not in mastering the attributes of leadership. Every day, in a thousand different ways, we are trying to improve ourselves by learning how to do things. We spend a lifetime gathering knowledge in classrooms, in textbooks, and through experiences. Now, if knowledge is power, if knowledge is the forerunner to success, then why do we fall short of our objectives? Why, in spite of all our knowledge and in spite of our collective experiences, do we find ourselves aimlessly wandering, settling for a life of existence rather than a life of substance? There may be many answers to this question. Your answers may be different from your associates, your spouse, or your friends. While there may be many answers to this question, the fundamental answer is the absence of discipline. Applying all that we know. That's the key word, discipline. Self-discipline. We might add one more word here, consistent. Consistent self-discipline. It doesn't really matter how smart you are or how much you know if you don't use it. It doesn't really matter that you graduated magna cum laude if you're stuck in a low-paying job. It doesn't really matter if you attended every seminar that comes to town if you don't apply what you've learned. Better than knowledge is applied knowledge. And once we've applied our knowledge, we must study the results of that process. Apply our knowledge, study the results, refine our approach. Finally, by trying and observing and refining and trying again, our knowledge will inevitably produce worthy results. Admirable results. And with the joy and results of our efforts, we continue to apply, to learn, to observe, to fuel our ambition. With the positive reinforcement of continued progress, pretty soon, we'll find that we're swept into a spiral of achievement. A vertical rise to success. And the ecstasy of that total experience makes for a life of triumph over tragedy, dullness, and mediocrity. But for this whole process to work for us, we must first master the art of discipline. Self-discipline. Consistent self-discipline. It takes consistent self-discipline to master the art of setting goals, to master the art of time management, to master the art of leadership, to master the art of parenting and relationships. If we don't make consistent self-discipline part of our daily lives, the results we seek will be sporadic and elusive. It takes a consistent effort to truly manage our valuable time or we'll be consistently frustrated. Our time will be eaten up by others whose demands are stronger than our own. It takes discipline to conquer the nagging voices in our minds, the fear of failure, the fear of success, the fear of poverty, the fear of a broken heart. It takes discipline to keep trying when that nagging voice within us brings up the possibility of failure. It takes discipline to admit our errors and recognize our limitations. The voice of the human ego speaks to all of us. Sometimes, the voice of ego says that we should magnify our value beyond our results. It leads us to exaggerate, to not be totally honest. It takes discipline to be totally honest, both with ourselves and with others. Be certain of one thing. Every exaggeration of the truth, once detected by others, destroys our credibility and makes all that we say and do suspect. As soon as a business colleague figures out that we tend to exaggerate, guess what? They'll always think we exaggerate, and they'll never quite hold us in the same regard again. Never. The tendency to exaggerate, distort, or even withhold the truth is an inherent part of all of us. It starts when we're kids. Johnny says, I didn't do it. Well, maybe Johnny didn't do it, but he probably had something to do with it. And then it continues when we're adults, exaggerating the benefits of a product to make a sale, exaggerating our net worth to impress old friends, exaggerating how close we are to closing a deal to impress the boss. And only an all-out disciplined assault can overcome this tendency. It takes discipline to change a habit because habits are formed a little bit each day. Every day, every day, once habits are formed, they act like a giant cable. They act like a nearly unbreakable instinct that only long-term disciplined activity can change. We must unweave every strand of the cable of habits slowly and methodically until the cable that once held us in bondage becomes nothing more than scattered strands of wire. It takes the consistent application of a new discipline, a more desirable one, to overcome one which is less desirable. It takes discipline to plan. It takes discipline to execute our plan. It takes discipline to look with full objectivity at the results of our applied plan. And it takes discipline to change either our plan or our method of executing that plan if the results are poor. It takes discipline to be firm when the world throws opinions at our feet. 
It takes discipline to ponder the value of someone else's opinion when our pride and our arrogance lead us to believe that we are the only ones with the answers. With this consistent discipline applied to every area of our lives, we can discover untold miracles and uncover unique possibilities and opportunities. Now, if discipline is the key word and if discipline is the key action, then what exactly is discipline? One good answer might be, Discipline is a constant human awareness of the need for action and a conscious act by us to implement that action. Discipline is an awareness of the constant need for action and a conscious act to implement that action. If our awareness and our implementations occur at the same time, then we begin a valued sequence of disciplined activity. Now, here's the other side of discipline. If there's considerable time that passes between the moment of awareness and the time of our implementation, then that is called procrastination. Procrastination, doing it tomorrow instead of today. Procrastination is almost the exact opposite of discipline. The voice within us says, get it done. Discipline then says, do it now. Do it to the best of your ability. Today, tomorrow, and always, until finally, the worthy deed becomes instinctive. Procrastination says, later, tomorrow, whenever I get a chance. Procrastination also says, do what is necessary to get by or to impress others. Do what you can, but not what you must. In every circumstance we face, we are constantly presented with these two choices. Do it now or do it later. Discipline and procrastination, a choice between a disciplined existence, bearing the fruit of achievement and contentment, or procrastination, the easy life for which the future will bear no fruit, only the bare branches of mediocrity. The rewards of a disciplined life are great, but they are often delayed until sometime in the future. The rewards for the lack of discipline are immediate, but they are minor in comparison to the immeasurable rewards of consistent self-discipline. An immediate reward for lack of discipline is a fun day at the beach. But future reward of discipline is owning the beach. For most, we choose today's pleasure rather than tomorrow's fortune. So how can you get rid of the easy distractions? How can you keep your mind on what you're trying to do? How can you keep an attitude of doing it all and doing it now? How can you make the choice of discipline over procrastination? How can you stay focused on your ambitions? How can you avoid conversations at the water cooler? You can keep your focus on your work. You can get it done today instead of tomorrow. You've got to really work on your consistent self-discipline on a daily basis, or you'll find yourself distracted. Distracted by negative thoughts, distracted by negative people, distracted by water cooler chatter, and pretty soon, depending on the type of people you've associated with, distracted by doubt within yourself. Never underestimate the power of influence and associations, and never underestimate the power of your own consistent self-discipline. Now, let's take a closer look at discipline, at the three steps to becoming disciplined. First, true discipline is not the easiest option. Most people would rather sleep until 10 o'clock than get up at 6 o'clock. It's easier to go to bed late, sleep late, show up late, leave early. It's easier not to read. It's easier to turn on the television than to open a book. It's easier to do just enough than to do it all. Waiting is always easier than acting. Trying is always easier than doing. Imagine what life would be like if we didn't have to make our bed in the morning, or keep our garage clean, or pay our taxes, or show up for work tomorrow. Wouldn't it be fascinating if we didn't have to do these things? What do you suppose would become of us? You're right, not much. For whatever the reason, the system we live in and contribute to is designed to make the easiest things in life the most unprofitable. Profitable seems to be the most difficult. Our world is and always will be a constant battle between the life of ease and its momentary rewards, and a life of discipline and its far more significant rewards. Each has its own price. The price of discipline or the price of regret. We will pay one or the other. What we wish we had done is the voice of regret speaking in a sorrowful tone at a time when there is no going back. This is regret. No second chance. No, what would I do differently? Choose one or the other, but both will have their price. The price of discipline or the price of regret. One costs pennies, the other a fortune. Dewey said, there are hundreds of young men who would die for the truth, but very few who would spend five years studying to know what the truth is. Dying for the truth is much more dramatic than the discipline of studying it, one little piece at a time, one day at a time, one month at a time. But in the big picture, is dying for the truth really easier than adhering to the daily disciplines? The first lesson of discipline is that it isn't the easiest option. The second lesson of discipline is that it's a full-time activity, 
And we've said that the best form of discipline is consistent self-discipline. You see, the discipline that it takes to make your bed every day is the same discipline necessary for success in the world of business. The discipline to organize your garage is the same discipline to organize your business. All disciplines carry through to affect all parts of our lives. If we're disciplined in just one area and lazy in another, guess what? Pretty soon, the lazy side will creep in and destroy the disciplined side. The bad habits in one area of our life will eventually destroy our self-discipline in the areas we've been working on. Consistency cannot be inconsistent. Discipline is the mind being trained to control our lives. Discipline is a set of standards which we selected as a personal code of conduct. Discipline is imposing on ourselves the requirements for honoring these standards. Once we've adopted these standards of behavior and conduct, we're committed to honor them. And if we don't, then there can be no disciplined activity. We find ourselves announcing our standards to our relatives, our friends, our associates. We shout our beliefs and condemn those who believe any differently. But then we don't want the talk. We end up acting in a way far different from the beliefs we've shouted. We tell our kids that the TV is rotting their minds, yet we spend our evenings in front of it. We tell our employees that they must take advantage of every minute of the working day, yet we spend three hours at lunch. Do as I say, not as I do. This is inconsistent. This leads to a loss of credibility among those who watch us. And more importantly, this leads to a loss of credibility within ourselves. The only thing worse than one who is inconsistent in applying their self-imposed disciplines is one who has never considered the need or the value of discipline at all. These people seem to wander aimlessly, changing procedures, changing standards, changing loyalties, and shifting frequently from one commitment to another, leaving behind a trail of broken friendships, unfinished projects, and unfulfilled promises, all because of a discipline that was either non-existent or imposed so infrequently that it was ineffective. Here's the third step to becoming consistently self-disciplined. Realizing that discipline isn't the easiest option. Discipline is a full-time activity, day by day, every day. Then the third step to becoming self-disciplined is really a philosophy that holds one of life's unique promises. It simply says, for every disciplined effort, there is a multiple reward. That's one of life's great arrangements. It's like the law of sowing and reaping. In fact, it's an extension of the biblical law that says if you sow well, you reap well. Now here's a unique part of the law of sowing and reaping. Not only does it suggest that we'll all reap what we've sown, it also suggests that we'll reap much more. Life is full of laws that both govern and explain behaviors, but this may well be the major law we need to understand. For every disciplined effort, a multiple reward. What a concept. If you render unique service, your reward will be multiplied. If you're fair and honest and patient with others, your reward will be multiplied. If you give more than you expect to receive, your reward is more than you expect. But remember, the key word here, as you might well imagine, is discipline. Everything of value requires care and attention. Everything of value requires discipline. Children require discipline. They must have a structure built for them. They must have boundaries to work within so they feel secure and comfortable to explore and grow. They must learn to recognize what's right and what's wrong, what's acceptable behavior, what's not acceptable. Children require unwavering discipline, consistent discipline, or they'll be confused as to how they're supposed to behave. Likewise, our thoughts require discipline. We must set up our inner boundaries, our code of conduct, or our thought will be confused. And with confused thoughts, we'll end up being confused, hopelessly lost in the maze of life. And confused thoughts produce confused results. Look around you at this very moment in time. What might you be doing that needs attention? Perhaps you're listening to this program as you drive along in traffic, blowing your horn at someone ahead of you who isn't driving at the speed you'd like them to. Perhaps you're listening alone because you've had a disagreement with someone you love, or someone who loves you, and your anger won't allow you to speak to that person. Wouldn't this be an ideal time to examine your need for a new discipline? Perhaps you're on the brink of giving up, or starting over, or starting out, and the only missing ingredient to your incredible success story in the future is a new and self-imposed discipline that will make you stay longer, try harder, and work more intensely than you ever thought you possibly could. The most valuable form of discipline is the one that you impose on yourself. Don't wait for things to deteriorate so drastically that someone else must impose discipline into your life. Wouldn't that be tragic? How could you possibly explain the fact that someone else thought more of you than you thought of yourself? 
that they forced you to get up early and get out into the marketplace when you would have been content to let success go to someone else who cared more about themselves. Your life, my life, the life of each one of us is going to serve as either a warning or an example. A warning of the consequences of neglect, self-pity, lack of direction and ambition. Or an example of talent put to use, of discipline self-imposed, and of objectives clearly perceived and intensely pursued. Now, here's my definition of easy, it was something I could do. I figure if it's something you can do, it's easy. But here's a little parenthesis. I worked hard at it. I made sure my disciplines were in line, my habits were good, and I did all that I could. I found something that I could do, but I worked hard at it. I got up early, stayed up late, and worked hard from age 25 to 31. But what I did was easy, meaning it was something I could do well. You might ask, if it was so easy, how come during those six years all those other people around you didn't get rich? Here's why. It's easy not to. How else would you describe it? It's easy to keep doing the things that don't work. It's easy to keep bad habits. It's easy not to develop disciplines. So how come I got rich and they didn't? Here's a philosophical phrase. The things that are easy to do are also easy not to do. That's the difference between success and failure, between daydreams and ambitions. Here's the key formula for success. A few disciplines practiced every day. And those disciplines have to be well thought out. What should you spend your time doing? Don't waste your time on things that won't matter. But a few simple disciplines can change your whole economic future. Future with your family. Future with your business. Future with your enterprise, your sales career, your management career. A few simple disciplines. A few simple habits. Good habits. Repeated every day. Now, here's the formula for failure. Errors in judgment repeated every day. All you've got to do is to have a few errors in your judgment and repeat them every day. I'm telling you, they'll spin out of control. In 10 years, you'll end up driving to where you don't want to drive, wearing what you don't want to wear, living where you don't want to live, earning what you don't want to earn. A few errors every day, bad habits every day, it's disastrous. Now, here's why it's easy to repeat an error in judgment. Because failure doesn't fall at the end of the first day. Bad habits don't show their horrible results at the end of the first day, or the first week, or the first month. It's easy to get faked out. If disaster fell on us at the end of the first week, we'd change our philosophy. But it's so subtle. Errors in judgment, bad habits. They're so subtle, they get you a little off course, a little off course, a little off course. You keep drifting off course, and all of a sudden, you're caught. So, you've got the choice right now of one of two easies. Easy to do or easy not to do. I can give you, in one sentence, how I got rich by the time I was 31. I did not neglect to do the easy things I could do. For six years, I did not neglect. That's the key. I found something easy I could do that led to fortune, and I did not neglect to do it. The major reason for not having more of what you want in America, more health, more money, more power, more influence, more everything, the major reason is simple. Neglect. And if you don't take care of neglect, it becomes an infection, and then it becomes a disease. So, if you're in the habit of not doing all it takes to get ahead, get in the habit of doing all it takes. That's the first benefit of positive reinforcement, building good habits. Now, the second benefit of positive reinforcement is that it creates the energy to fuel additional achievement. It gives you the drive to do more, not only to keep on doing what's right, but to do more of what's right. The disciplines that will help you grow and get ahead, all the knowledge that what you're doing is paying off, creates more energy to keep going. How easy is it to get up in the morning when you know you're not doing all that it takes? It's not very easy at all. You can just lay there awake, thinking, oh, what's a few more minutes in bed? It won't matter much anyway. Wrong. It does matter. It will matter. Now, how easy is it to get up in the morning when you're pouring it on, doing the best you can, anxious to get going? Make progress toward your dreams? It's a whole different story. When you're resting to renew your reserves, it's much different than resting to avoid your day. When you're psyched up and excited for your life, when you're excited for what you plan to accomplish for the day, it's amazing. You'll wake up before the alarm clock. Your successes fuel your ambition. Your successes give you extra energy. Your successes pave the way for more successes. It's the snowball effect. With one success, you're excited to meet another, and another, and another, and pretty soon, the disciplines that were so difficult in the beginning, the disciplines that got you going, are now part of your philosophy. 
How do you know when you're successful? Do you have to be a millionaire? No. All we ask of you is that you earn all you possibly can. If you earn $10,000 a year and that's the best you can do, that's enough. And everything else will see to it that you're okay. The key is to just do the best you can. If it's $10,000 a year, wonderful. If it's $100,000 a year, wonderful. If it's a million a year, wonderful. It doesn't matter. $10,000 a year or a million a year, it doesn't matter as long as you've done the best you possibly can, earned the most you possibly can, been the most you possibly can. And here's why. The essence of life is growth. The essence of life is growth. To do the best you can. And here's what's interesting. Humans are the only life form that will do less than they possibly can. Humans are the only life form that will settle for less. Every other life form, except human beings, strive to its maximum capacity. How tall will a tree grow? As tall as it possibly can. You never heard of a tree growing half as high as it could. No, trees don't grow half. Trees send their roots down as deep as possible, stretch their limbs up as high as possible, produce every leaf possible, and every fruit possible. As a matter of fact, you never heard of a human physically growing half. We keep growing until we're done. So, that's a part of life we can't control. It's coded. And that's probably why we keep growing till we're done. Because we can't control that part. It's the rest of our growing that we control, the growing of our minds, the expansion of our minds, that we can control. And that's what tends to get away from us. All life forms inherently strive to their max, except human beings. Now, why wouldn't human beings strive to their maximum possibility? Here's why. Because we've been given the dignity of choice. That makes us different than alligators and trees and birds. The dignity of choice makes us different than all other life forms. And here's the choice. To become part of what we can be, enough to get by, or to become all that we can be. My best advice for you is to choose the all. Earn all you can. Make all the friends you can. Read as many books as you can. Develop as many skills as you can. See as much as possible. Do as much as possible. Make as much fortune as possible. There's no life like it. I'm telling you, once I got on track, I never looked back. Pick up the challenge. Go for it. Take the best of the two easies. Take the root of it's easy to get ahead. It's easy to do all you can. It's easy to succeed. It's easy. So if success is the steady progress toward your own personal goals, what then is failure? Is it failing on a project that ends with poor results? No, of course not. Is it launching a new product that fails miserably in the marketplace? No, of course not. Is it doing your best with your kids and having them disappoint you? No, of course not. There's no failure in pouring your heart and soul into something that didn't work. Rather, failure is not trying at all. If success is the steady progress toward your own personal goals, then failure is no progress at all. None. Not even trying. Success and failure are always linked together. Success and failure are always linked to ambition. And let's remember, success is doing. Failure is not doing. It's that simple. Tom Peters, world-renowned author and management expert, recently said, There is only one way to be in serious trouble today, and that is not to be trying, not to be failing, not to be stretching yourself. Success is a doing. You've got to actually do it. Activity is high priority in the life process to try and get maximum benefit out of what we have available, our resources, our skills, our knowledge, and our talents. Success is a doing that tries to get maximum benefit out of what we have available. Benjamin Disraeli, former Prime Minister of England, once said, Nothing can resist a human will that will stake even its existence on its purpose. I'll do it or die. What powerful words. We've already talked about resolve, doing it until. But here's what else resolve says. I will. Two of the most powerful words in our language. The formula for disaster? Could, should, don't. Here's the formula for fortune. Could, should, will. I will. I should. I can and I will. Two of the most powerful words in the language. I will. The man says, I will climb the mountain. They say it's too high, too difficult, too rocky, never been done before. The man says, hey, it's my mountain. I'll climb it. Pretty soon, you'll see me waving from the top, or dead on the side, because I'm not coming back until I've done it. Powerful. There are several studies that show the greatest achievers aren't those who fail the least. No, the greatest achievers are those least frightened of failure. They're willing to take on the challenge without the guarantee of success. Seeing the end but not sure when it will be or where it will be. 
Although success and failure go hand in hand, many people have a problem with failure. They think it's a bad word, has a bad connotation. They don't see it as a stepping stone, they see it as an end result. Quite often, success requires failure. Sometimes many failures. In every scientific discovery, there were dozens or hundreds of failures before one success. Without failure, opportunity cannot be created. Without failure, there can be no success. But what is the measure of success? How do you know if you're successful? Really successful? How do you know, especially when your success could be so vastly different from someone else's? Here's how you measure results. Making measurable progress in reasonable time. That's all life asks. Making measurable progress in reasonable time. So, you've got to be reasonable with time. Don't be unreasonable with time. Parents, don't be unreasonable with time. Managers, brokers, business associates have a little patience. You can't ask somebody every five minutes. How are you doing now? That's too soon. You've got to make progress. You've got to make progress in real, reasonable time. You've got to take a look at the numbers and see how you're doing. It's the name of the game. How often should you weigh the new baby? Well, you say, I'll weigh the new baby next spring. No, you can't wait until next spring. You've got to weigh the new baby often. And the answer is yes, of course. To see whether it's gaining weight or it's losing weight. What if it's losing weight? The alarm bells have got to go off. You can't let a little baby lose weight very long. It's called disaster. These numbers are important. How often should you check the corporation to see if it's healthy or not? You say, well, in a couple of years, we'll get all the accounts together. No, you'll be out of business in Las Vegas, the big gambling houses. Guess how often they put together a financial statement to see where they are? Several times a day. Why? Because so much is happening. If you don't learn when to shut down some of those tables, you'll be out of business by midnight. You can't wait till midnight. You can't wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow is too late. You've got to know the numbers. What is your cholesterol count? You don't know, and you don't care? You just got your fingers crossed for the future? We better come and get your family and take them to safety. Come on, be responsible for the set of your own sale. Leave it to no one else but yourself and learn to refine these numbers for yourself. Now, what if your results are not that good right now? What if you're going through some tough times and aren't quite sure what to do next? You know why I do seminars and lectures and write books and audio programs? So I can attend them all myself. Read it again myself. Listen again myself. I don't do it just to hear myself talk, and I don't do it for the money. I do it because the teacher always receives the greatest lessons. He seeks to teach others. What's the best way out of a blue mood? Talk somebody else through theirs. What's the best way out of a mental energy slump? Talk somebody else through theirs. What's the best way to start solving your own problems? Talk to somebody else about theirs. Why? Because when you start talking someone else through their blue mood or their mental slump or their problem, you'll hear yourself say amazing things. You'll hear all the knowledge that you've gathered come out to help this other person, and it will ultimately help you. By hearing it again, it just works that way. It's often easier to tap our resources for somebody else than it is to tap them for ourselves. Sometimes defeat is the best beginning. Why? Well, for one, if you're at the very bottom, there's only one way to go, up. But more importantly, if you're flat on your back mentally and financially, you usually become sufficiently disgusted to reach way down deep inside yourself and pull out miracles, pull out talents and abilities and desires and determination. When you're flat broke or flat miserable, you'll eventually become so disgusted that you'll pull out the basic essentials required to make everything better. And it's in the face of adversity that things begin to change, that you begin to change. With enough disgust, desire, and determination to change your life, you'll start saying, I've had it. Enough of this, no more, never again. And here's where the miracle begins. I've had it. Enough, no more, never again. These words and these thoughts really rattle the power of time and fate and circumstances. And these three things, time, fate, and circumstances, all get together and say, okay, okay. We can see that we have no power here. We're facing some major resolve. This guy's not going to give up. He's had it. He's done with all this nonsense. We better step aside and let this guy get by. Resolve. Inspiration through disgust. But a lot of people don't change themselves. They wait for circumstances to change, the government to change, life to change. What'll they do? Not much. These poor, unfortunate folks accept their defeats and wallow in their self-pity. 
Why? Because they refuse to take control of the situation. They refuse to take control of their life, their career, their health, their relationships, their finances. They refuse to take control and take responsibility and get sufficiently disgusted to change it. But if you are disgusted, if you are making changes, if this program finds you in the middle of your own personal slump, then I have some words to offer you. Your present failure is a temporary condition. It is only a temporary condition. You will rebound from failure, just as surely as you gravitated into failure. Somebody once suggested to me during an about of failure that I should tell myself, this too shall pass. I firmly believe that, you're only given as much as you can handle, as much negativity, as much failure, as much disappointment. This too shall pass, if you grasp for a new beginning, if you pull yourself up and move back into the world with a plan. So as foolish as it might sound, be thankful for your current limitations or failures. For they are building blocks from which to create greatness. You can go where you want to go. You can do what you want to do. You can become what you want to become. You can do it all starting now, starting right where you are. So be grateful for adversity. But for your future, make it work for you, not against you. Make your failures give birth to great opportunity, not prolong agony. Make your disgust lead to inspiration, not depression. The world will willingly sit by and let you wallow in your sorrows until you die broken alone. And here's what else the world will do. The world will step aside and let you by once you decide that your present situation is only temporary, once you decide to get back on your feet and make your mark. The world doesn't care which choice you make, to stop here or to go on. The world doesn't really care. So you have to, you have to care in your own enlightened self-interest. Give a run at adventure. Keep your eyes firmly on the achievement, on your ambition, and not merely existence and self-pity. Make a commitment to excellence. Success is something you attract by the person you become. Success is not something you pursue. What you pursue usually eludes you, like a butterfly, something you go after that you can't catch. Success is something you attract like a magnet by the person you become. To attract attractive people, you must be attractive. To attract powerful people, you must be powerful. To attract committed people, you must be committed. Instead of going to work on them, you go to work on yourself. You work harder on yourself than you work on the job. And if you become, you can attract. The whole key is to make yourself valuable, to make yourself attractive, to make yourself skillful, competent, willing, powerful, unique, sophisticated, cultured, being able to manage, in control, healthy. The whole key really to the future is personal development. Because the greatest gift you can give to someone else is your personal development, self-development, self-investment. The greatest gift you can give is your own personal development. If I become 10 times wiser, 10 times stronger, 10 times brighter, 10 times more competent, think of what that will do for my success. If I grow, think of what that will do for my future. Self-development earns success. Self-investment earns respect. And the only way to make a better and better investment in your future is to become better and stronger and wiser and more competent. And the more attractive you become, the more attractive you are. And the more attractive you are, the more you attract success. Self-development, self-investment attracts success. That's powerful. Now, here's what would be pitiful. If your income grew and you didn't grow. Because here's what usually happens. If your income takes some jumps, it's best that you grow quickly up to where your income is. Why? Because otherwise, your income will soon come back to where you are. Somebody once said, if someone hands you a million dollars, Best you become a millionaire so you get to keep the money. I'm telling you, success doesn't want to hang around an incompetent person. That's the problem with winning the lottery. The lack of self-development to be able to master it and keep it. And now the fortune is bigger than the person, rather than the person being bigger than the fortune. If you're a parent, use that as a challenge to grow personally. Use the challenge of parenting to grow, to see what you can become. One ancient writer said this. Here are some reassuring words. God's arm is not short. Aren't those reassuring words? God's arm is not short. You can't think of anything more pitiful than a God with a short arm. Poor God, his arm's too short. He can't reach all the way. Can't reach out to all of us. This writer said, no, be reassured. God's arm is not short. He can reach all the way, and he can reach everybody. Shouldn't that be said of every father, of every mother? They can reach all of their children. They can reach all the way. They don't lack stories and illustrations. They don't lack wisdom and power. 
And the only way you can become that kind of parent, the only way you can keep up that process, is by personal development. By becoming better than you are, stronger than you are, wiser than you are, becoming great, growing, so that your investment grows as your children grow, you grow, your power grows, your influence grows, your wisdom grows, your command of the language grows. You see, that's what's challenging, to be involved in a situation that makes you grow. If that situation is success, keep growing to be bigger than your fortune. If that situation is failure, keep growing until you're bigger than the problem. Keep growing, keep becoming, keep doing it, until, now, there are two qualities that can increase your chances of success. Two very important qualities. Number one, patience. Number two, persistence. Let's talk about patience for a moment. Patience is what? Learning to handle the passing of time. Once you've had an appetite for success and you start going for it, now you've got to learn to handle the passing of time. Why? Because it takes time. It takes time to build a corporate work of art. It takes time to build a symphony orchestra with flawless music and harmony that sends you on flights of ecstasy, to be remembered long after the orchestra has shut down and the lights have gone out. It takes time to put harmony together. It takes time to build a life. It takes time to build an enterprise. It takes time to get through school. It takes time to develop and grow. So, give your enterprise time. Give your business time. If you're in management, give your people time. If you're a parent, give your kids time. Don't be too short, too quick. Give them time. Now, not forever, but time. It takes time. Here's the ultimate challenge. You got to have patience with yourself. It takes time to make changes in habit and discipline. It takes time to correct old errors in judgment and to finally give up old blame and pick up new responsibility. It took me some time. I used to blame the government, blame taxes, blame the company, blame the marketplace. It took me a long time to give that up. That was a pretty comfortable list to explain my empty bank account, pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, not doing well, embarrassed by my situation. It took time to give that up and only blame myself. That took a while. So, have patience with yourself. And while you're dealing with the passing of time, the second thing you need to do is to keep doing it, be persistent. Be tenacious, keep doing it. As long as you are patient and persistent, it's hard to elude success. As long as you maintain patience and persistence tenacity, there's only one person, just one person, that will draw the line between success and failure. And that person is you. So, be patient, be persistent. You need both patience and persistence together. And here's why. Lack of patience is probably the worst enemy of ambition. While your ambition keeps growing, keeps moving, keeps looking for new ways to succeed, impatience tends to grow frustrated. Impatience won't allow for persistence. Impatience wants to give up. Impatience calls discouragement failure. But your ambition won't let you give up so easily. Not if you're persistent. What others may call failure. Ambition calls a learning opportunity, a chance to make adjustments along the charted course to success. Ambition knows something else too. Ambition knows that the longer the achievement is incoming, the more value it is. But let me give you a few aspects of patience, some examples that might help illustrate just how valuable it is. There are six aspects of patience. And here's number one. Knowing when an opportunity is right and when more preparation is needed. Let's say you're opening up a restaurant specializing in fresh seafood. You're all excited to get going, to get the money coming in instead of it all going out. You're all excited. So because you're all excited, you want to open early. Your impatience gets the best of you, and so you do open before your scheduled grand opening. Customers start coming in. They're all excited about this new, great restaurant, and everybody wants some fresh seafood. They're all ordering fresh seafood from the menu. But now you panic. You haven't got any. You're not ready. The fresh seafood shipment won't come in for a week. Impatience has just killed the restaurant. Now, let's say you've got a great new product that's scheduled to come out on the market in the next several months. Everything's going according to plan, so you start planning your ads, start planning big public relations events. You're so sure that it's going to happen that you set a date. The engineers told you that the product's not ready, but you're sure it will be. You start planning everything, invite lots of people, influential people, buyers of your product. You're so excited that you went ahead without the product actually being done. Come the week of the grand unveiling, the engineers come to you and say it still doesn't work. Your impatience just lost you credibility in the marketplace. 
That's number one. Be patient in knowing the difference between when the opportunity is right and when more work needs to be done. Here's number two. Remain alert even if opportunity doesn't come right away. Make sure that your patience allows you to keep your eyes open and ready for opportunity. Keep looking. Be patient. Number three. Keep preparing for opportunities even if there's a delay, even if things aren't going just the way you think they should. Keep your disappointments at bay and keep getting ready for opportunities. Be prepared. Always be prepared. Don't let impatience allow you to give up. Number four. Impatience take the little setbacks in stride. Take the little successes in stride. Don't let small disappointments discourage you. Don't let the little successes delude you. Avoid the emotional roller coaster that will always disrupt your plan. Number five. If you're waiting on the decisions of others, be patient. You cannot control the decision-making abilities of others. You cannot control their timing. If your project was to come up before the board in one meeting and time ran out and they moved your project to the top of the agenda for the next meeting, be patient. Don't be frustrated about what you have no control over. And number six. Take a vacation from your ambition. If you've been working day after day, week after week, month after month without a break, take a vacation for your ambition. The patient person, secure in their ambition, knows that the drive and ambition will still be there even after some time off. As a matter of fact, with some time off, the ambition will have a stronger pull than ever when you come back to it. Persistence is patience in action. Persistence is creative, always looking for new opportunities. Persistence is courageous. It doesn't give in to fear. Persistence is hopeful. It doesn't let discouragement through the door. Persistence is positive. It keeps you on track with your plans and your goals. And the last thing that persistence is is cheerful, not gloomy. Cheerful persistence knows that gloom and depression and disappointments waste energy. Cheerfulness creates it. Patience and persistence are both required for success. And as we end this site, please remember that success and failure are also intricately intertwined. For without failure, you can never appreciate success. And quite often, without failure, there will never be success.